The work of uh, Terry and, and John and our, our next speaker, Paul Zach, helped me answer the question, directly anyway, why should you be good without God? If there's no God, why should you be moral? What's the, what, what's the ultimate basis for it? And in a way, the answer coming here is that because it's built into us, it's, it's hardwired into us, it's in, in our brain. We're rewarded for doing these kinds of good things. It's not, it's also, yes, because we have a social contract and all those political social reasons, but what we're getting at here is something much deeper, which then gets us to the problem of if there's no God, what's the absolute, you know, Archimedean point from which we can look down and determine good and good and uh, right, right and wrong, good and evil, and so on. What, isn't there some outside source? Well, in a way, evolution has given us that sort of sense of transcendency. And Paul Zach's uh, work I read because he not only does the brain stuff about uh, neurochemistry, oxytocin, and trust, but also looks at social and political conditions and how a country can structure its social system that would generate more trust or less trust, that kind of thing. Dr. Zach is at the center of neuroeconomics uh, at Claremont Graduate University, where uh, I, I got my degree too, so fellow alum here, where he conducts research on the neurobiology of trust, the neural substrates of reward valuation, and the relationship of touch and trust, social cognition producing cooperation or conflict, decision making under uncertainty, the neural foundation of human capital, the effect of institutional design on economic development, and the link between economic systems, social systems, and trust. Dr. Paul Zach. That was a wonderful group here. I'm glad to see so many people have shown up. You probably brought, I don't know, a friend or a family member with you, but mostly you're sitting next to strangers. Make anybody uncomfortable? If it makes you uncomfortable, you can't raise your hand because then people would know. Okay. This is very, there, we had one hand. This is very unusual. That, that's right. If you look around, people don't look stressed out here. Uh, we seem very comfortable amount of, around many people with whom we're not acquainted. We're not closely genetically related to most of these people, yet we're not stressed. If I took a room full of rats and did the same thing, fur would fly, right? And blood. Okay, how do we do this? How do we figure out that it's okay to sit next to uh, Susan, but Michael, he's a sketchy guy, I don't want to sit too close to him, something's going to happen, I don't know what it is, I got a bad feeling about it. Um, this is something we've been studying for a, a number of years. Uh, there's kind of two ways we can approach this problem. One is the sort of James Madison approach, which is, you know what, people are bad, I don't want to be too uh, uh, careful, I, mean, I want to be very careful. I want to make sure that I kind of distrust people because of my sort of view of human nature is that given a chance, people will cheat me. Or this, this sort of a Tennessee Williams approach, which is, we're always depending on the kindness of strange nurse. Right? I, got, I was in France last week, and my French is terrible. And I asked thousands of people in, in bad French, where's the bus, where do I go, help me to the plane, and people, by and large, were extraordinarily nice. Why would they do that? I mean, from a, from a sort of purely uh, survival of the fittest evolutionary perspective, these people are burning energy and time to help me, and they share almost no genes with me. In, in, sort of, in a close sense, they share lots of genes with me in sort of the human sense, but I'm not in their immediate family or even distant family. Right? I'm probably not related to them closely at all. Why would you do such a thing? I think those two questions, how we can sit next to strangers, in fact, how we like to be with strangers, many humans actually move to big cities and say it's enjoyable and exciting. It's electric to be in New York City. Right? We're not hermits. So if we look at cross-country data, this is the proportion of people who said people in their country are very or mostly trustworthy. Look at the top left-hand corner, you see Nor Norway, Sweden, Denmark, the Netherlands, Canada, right? Almost two-thirds of the people in Norway say people in my country are trustworthy. Okay, you know, U.S. is in the middle, around 45%. This is a mid-90s data. In the bottom right-hand corner, you see 3% of Brazilians say people are trustworthy. <laughs> Uh, up from that, Peru, Philippines, Turkey, Colombia, Venezuela. Okay, so if you drop your wallet in um, <laughs> Lima or in Rio de Janeiro, it's not going to be returned. And if you drop your wallet in Oslo, 
chances are very high that someone will return that wallet. Now, again, if you think about what drives these uh, kinds of behaviors, uh, the, the environment in which you're interacting in Lima versus also are, is much different. Uh, so uh, some work uh, published a couple years ago identified the kind of environments that promote high levels of trust or low levels of trust. And this includes a social environment, economic environment, legal environment, and political environments. And when we did this, we showed that uh, trust is among the most powerful factors economists have ever found to explain why countries are poor. Poor countries are, by and large, low trust countries. Why is that? Because the kinds of transactions that are necessary to generate increasing wealth or increasing standards of living occur over time. I need to make an investment in a new business, and I need to hire people. I need all those things to happen without having someone steal all my capital, without having the government appropriate my business. Right? Those things occur over time. So in, in environments in which trust is high, in which contracts are enforced, uh, those investments are greater, and therefore the creation of wealth is greater, and living standards are higher. Okay, so this is big news. All of a sudden, we discovered this, this big gun to alleviate poverty. I'm getting calls. I go to the World Bank. This is great. So I write one paper. I'm this big expert on trust. <laughs> Wonderful. But I have this nagging feeling in the back of my head when I give these talks that I've really missed a big part of the, of the question. And the big question is not necessarily, I mean, I think this is a big question. How do I, how do I design environments across country, across countries or across uh, uh, communities to generate higher trust and therefore greater vision in what's going to happen in the future and the ability for people to take risks and, in fact, uh, generate wealth? That's great. That's big news. But playing the role of the trust expert, um, I left out this other kind of nagging big question, which is, for a fixed environment, how do two people decide to trust each other, right? Why do you think that the person sitting next to you today, I don't know, does not have a bad intention, is not going to hurt you, is not going to rob you? How do you make that determination? And if you talk to people kind of casually, they seem to make this determination very quickly. So I go to a cocktail party, I don't know very many people, I meet someone for the first time, and right away I have this sort of intuition like, Wow, great, great person. I really enjoyed meeting this person. I don't know, we kind of hit it off. Or another person, maybe Michael, scary guy, I don't know what it is. He's kind of driving me nuts. I can't put my finger on it. I can't tell you about it. Uh, John Allman would say, I have this intuition for these particular uh, social interactions. And that intuition informed me that, I don't know, Michael's a sketchy guy. Okay, so how do we start to study this? Right? If, if uh, we're going to design these environments, it actually would be nice to know the physiologic mechanisms that allow us to have this sort of conditional psychology of trust. Right? If I go into this room and I see these individuals, I have to pretty quickly know, okay, here's a person I can trust, here's a person I can't. If I don't have that uh, quick and perhaps dirty, fast intuition on what's going to happen, potentially my survival's at stake. Okay, so... And humans seem to do this much more than other uh, animals. Uh, so the first thing you want to do is put some kids in a laboratory and just have them make these decisions and ask them what happened. How did you make this decision? It turns out that people have a hard time articulating why they trust somebody and why they're trustworthy. Because now I have a further problem, which is you know, if I just have this sort of simplistic model, this kind of very rational model, uh, people go in, they decide, uh, this person I'm going to trust, this person I'm not, I'm not going to. Um, my job's done. Then I can just tell you, well, people trust because of, uh, I don't know, uh, blonde hair and uh, brown shoes and whatever. Right? These are things that determine trust or not. Not that these intuitions aren't, aren't uh, important, these kind of physical characteristics. Um, if I take that away, remove the personal, you're asking with a person, but you can't see them, you can't talk to them, why would you still trust them? Oh, and also, you only get to interact with them once, and I'll put some money on the table. So you guys can, if you can figure out how to trust each other, you can take some money home with you. Okay, that's what I'm going to investigate. Uh, in fact, uh, humans have a very strong desire to interact socially. Um, and this begins with the first intimate relationship in your life. That's with your mother. Right? And um, there's a large literature in um, looking at non-human mammals that suggests that um, they are mechanisms through which 
mother to infant bonding occurs, and in some species, long-term pair bonds among adults also occurs. And um, so I hypothesized that uh, this particular neuroactive hormone called ketocin, which, which is associated with pro-social behaviors in, in uh, non-human animals, might also work in humans. So we designed an experiment. And uh, I'm going to tell you about the experiment in just a moment. And we mentioned that oxytocin is a very simple molecule. It's made up of nine amino acids. It uh, is medically uninteresting, which is why I think it was unstated in humans before I began doing this work. Um, unless you're a human female who's giving birth or breastfeeding, oxytocin is irrelevant to your life. So we thought. We wondered if there was a behavioral effect of oxytocin. Uh, and lastly, I should say that, uh, very consistent with John's talk, uh, at, people are not kind of open to conscious awareness and how they make these determinations of who's, who they think will be trustworthy and who isn't. And we find masses of oxytocin receptors in humans um, in uh, old areas of the brain, probably genetically old areas of the brain, particularly the amygdala and the hypothalamus. Uh, so if this is a story about oxytocin, and guess what it is, because I'm here, then this sort of explains why we do this intuitively. Right? Um, this is not something that's uh, kind of higher cortical activity. I'm not doing a cost-benefit analysis. I'm doing this very fast, um, emotional, intuitive determination of who I should be interacting with and who I shouldn't. Okay, so the first question is, how can I measure trust in a laboratory setting? So uh, some clever experimental economists um, out of Vernon Smith's lab uh, set up a, a kind of interesting social dilemma, which I will present to you in a moment, uh, in which you can measure both trust and trustworthiness and as I said, we put a little money on the table so that we invest these decisions with weight. If I just ask you randomly, oh, do you trust people? Oh, sure I do, of course. But now, if you can't communicate with someone and you've got cash sitting there and, um, you know, it might be a, for undergraduates, a reasonably large amount of cash, uh, how might I do that? Okay, so the money here is important only to make the decisions uh, um, important to the individuals. Um, it's not, I think, inherently interesting itself. Okay, so here's a social dilemma. We rec recruit a bunch of kids for this experiment. They all receive 10 bucks for showing up. Uh, they're instructing the experiment. There's no deception. And um, I'll show you the laboratory in a minute. And they can't talk to each other, but they're randomly assigned by computer to pairs. And they're instructed in this task, which is uh, you're randomly matched within your pair. Uh, you're randomly determined to be either decision maker one or decision maker two. And decision maker one will be prompted by computer software um, to uh, see if he or she would like to send some portion of uh, his or her $10 show-up fee to someone else they've been paired with in a lab. And the person, the other person they're paired with, the decision maker too, knows that whatever uh, is sent to them comes out of decision maker one's account and is tripled in decision maker two's account. So if I'm decision maker one and I said, well, I think I'll send, uh, I don't know, eight of my $10 show-up fee, I keep two, and the person I paired with gets 24, plus the 10 they got for showing up, they have 34 bucks. Then at some point, decision maker two will be given the information about how much decision maker one was sent to them and will be prompted to send some amount back to them, but they don't have to. You only do it once, and there's no one looking over your shoulder. It's a so-called double-blind experiment. So your identity is masked from the other individuals as well as from the experimenters. I don't know what you're doing, no one else knows what you're doing. So just think about that for a second. You're in the lab, and I'll show you a picture. You have, a, you have computer stations, you have partitions around you, you can't see anybody else. What do you do with your 10 bucks? So this has been run literally hundreds of times around the world, uh, by the way, for also for much larger stakes, and the, the transfer from decision maker one to decision maker two is commonly viewed as a measure of trust. Right? If I take money out of my account and triple it in your account, I'm saying, hey, these Yahoo experimenters are gonna make the pie a lot bigger. Let's go with this. Let's, let's try to you know, leave here with some cash. And you're expecting decision maker two to figure it out. Like, you know I took money out of, I sacrificed to send you a bunch of cash. Now do what you're supposed to do, which is share it, okay? The problem is, it's a one-shot interaction. If, if decision maker two decides to keep everything, there's nothing you can do about it, okay? So what do people do? In general, most decision maker ones sent a fair amount of cash. The average is around $5, and decision maker twos tend to return about um, half of what they're sent. 
it's always better to be the decision maker two in this task. You make more money. Um, so in our experiments, decision maker ones, on average, uh, leave the lab with $14, and decision maker twos, on average, leave the lab with $17. So somehow, lacking communication, just sending this stress signal, they have uh, kind of induced a social obligation to play nice. Okay. Now the question is, what drives this? The sort of standard model in economics, as Professor Allman suggested, is I should never trust anybody. I should never leave money on the table. So the so-called Nash equilibrium, this is a, 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 can be written down as a game, a strategic interaction. The Nash equilibrium is to send zero. And the logic here is if I'm decision maker two, what's better, more money or less money? Well, more money, right? So I should keep everything. Therefore, if I'm decision maker one, I should send zero. So the, the prediction from standard economics is $10 for everybody. But in fact, my subjects make a lot more than $10. So that clearly that equilibrium notion is wrong because people are making more money on average. Why is it wrong? And why can't you just tell me why you're doing what you're doing? So in my experiments, uh, subjects are informed that the $10 they're being paid to show up not only compensates for them, their time up to an hour and a half in the lab, it's literally blood money. I'm gonna take four tubes of blood from their arm when they make a decision. Okay, again, one-shot interaction, no deception, uh, you can't communicate with other people. And uh, we time the session, so I'll start in the early afternoon, which is the uh, trough of the diurnal variation of hormones. So the difference between the first subject and the last subject uh, is minimized. And we're on two conditions, the standard trust social dilemma that I just explained to you, and then a control condition uh, in which uh, I'm gonna have the same transfer from DM1 to DM2 absent a social intention. And how do I do that? I'm gonna use a very expensive piece of laboratory equipment, which I built at Walmart for $10. I took a plastic container and I covered it with duct tape, and I put in 11 ping pong balls numbered zero to 10. And I had the DM1s publicly pull a ping pong ball out, and that amount of money was taken out of their account and tripled in their player two's account. And it was on publicly, I shake it up, it's noisy, so everybody knows that there was no, there was no intention uh, on uh, decision maker one's account. So the question here is, is this a social interaction, right? Uh, if it's social, if it's not just a money issue, if it's social, then it should activate, or we hypothesize, this should activate the release of oxytocin. If it's just cash, then you're just, um, I don't know, you're responding to getting cash. So we're gonna control for that. This is the lab we ran, that, ran it at, this is at UCLA. It's a large lab, there are 67 stations. We run between 16 and 20 subjects, so no one is sat next to each other. Uh, they're spread out in the lab, and you can see there are partitions that are pulled out um, around each subject. So there's a, there's a large uh, degree and expectation of privacy. Okay, so you make your decision sequentially. I call it your, your uh, identity masking code. You make a decision, you type in the computer. When you're done, you raise your hand. We take you to a back room, and we draw four tubes of blood from your arm. Here's an actual subject and my collaborators uh, getting blood from a subject. Why? Because oxytocin uh, um, can be measured uh, peripherally in blood. It's not stable in other uh, bodily fluids. Uh, once they get that blood, it immediately goes on ice. We want to have the decision and the signal um, be as close in time as possible and not have it degrade. Oxytocin degrades fairly rapidly in, uh, at room temperature. Uh, once they're uh, put on ice and this, all the blood has been drawn, from subjects, uh, we centrifuge these, we separate out blood serum and plasma, and these are put into uh, little microtubes and stored on dry ice and then transferred to a minus 70 centigrade freezer until they're ready for analysis. So the point here is we're trying to preserve the signal as much as possible. Uh, oxytocin levels uh, are basically zero in your body, again, absent giving birth or breastfeeding. Uh, so if, if, there's a, if there's a surge of oxytocin, we've got to get it and preserve it. And what do we find? Indeed, we find that uh, uh, individuals who received a signal of trust had a surge in oxytocin, roughly twice the oxytocin levels in their blood uh, as those who received the same average amount of money absent a social intention. Okay, so receiving this signal of trust, this monetary transfer denoting the social intention, provokes the release of oxytocin. And indeed, we find that uh, higher oxytocin levels are uh, statistically associated with greater trustworthiness. That is, a decision maker two is more, more likely to return money to decision maker ones when they had higher oxytocin on board. With one exception. <laughs> and I should mention that's my little daughter. Uh, we had a wonderful natural experiment 
right? This could be noise. And we measure 10 other hormones, lots of interactions. These are re reproductive hormones. So oxytocin interacts with uh, estradiol and testosterone and cortisol. We, we measured all those things and all the direct, all the effects we can find are through oxytocin. But there's this wonderful natural experiment, which is some women in our experiment were ovulating. And when is ovulation, uh, how do we know it's ovulation? There's a spike in progesterone. By the way, progesterone also spikes during pregnancy. Because we had blood, we ruled out that any of our subjects were pregnant. They were not. So we had women who were ovulating, and progesterone is known to inhibit the uptake of oxytocin by its receptor. And guess what? These women had the same surge in oxytocin, but their behavior was different. They were less trustworthy. Okay. Why is that? Uh, one evolutionary story is that progesterone puts a break on the uh, desire for, if you will, social intercourse, because if social intercourse leads to actual intercourse, uh, there's a high metabolic cost if you take that decision too lightly. Um, so we looked for that interrupter, in fact, we found it. So this suggests to us that this is a direct effect of oxytocin on behavior and not an indirect effect. Okay, and lastly, we see that when there's a trust signal, um, DM2s return 54% of what they're sent, and uh, when the uh, transfer of money is done through a ping pong ball draw, they only return 18%. So very high correlation between what you're sent and what you return uh, when oxytocin uh, is high. Okay, we had a, here, here's actually a scatter plot of the data. So we see trustworthiness, that is the, the back transfer from DM2 to DM1 and oxytocin levels. And uh, you can see that there roughly is a, is a sort of strong positive relationship, except I have these five dots circled in red who uh, are a little bit special. They, they had this big oxytocin surge, but they didn't return very much money. So there's a technical term for these guys in the trade. They're called bastards, <laughs> right? So someone sacrificed $9, 10 $11, you know, 9 10 $8 of their show-up fee, sent to these guys, they got tripled, they had $30 or $40 sitting around, and they chose to return zero or almost zero. Who are these guys? And what's the source of their behavior? Well, we had a very extensive social survey, so we asked some questions. And remember, these are all reproductive hormones. So uh, uh, nature is a very conservative system. It's going to hijack the same mechanisms uh, for many uses. And um, so we asked a lot of questions about uh, reproductive behaviors. We find is that these uh, interesting, uh, nice folks are emotionally labile. They are much more active sexually than uh, the rest of the group. Um, they believe it's okay to accumulate wealth while the others live in poverty. Uh, they believe others are trustworthy and they themselves are very trustworthy. This was done before they actually did the experiment. Um, so what it looks like is that for most people, uh, the hormone, the surge in oxytocin explains the, the uh, bulk of the variation in the data. But for people in the tail of distribution, it seems like personality traits matter more. And currently, we're looking into uh, these sort of personality traits by looking at a number of pathological populations. Uh, so we don't have a full story on were these guys dropped on their heads, or they just had a bad genetic draw, or maybe they had a bad day. Um, come back in two years, I'll report to you. Uh, lastly, this is all correlational data. So in a paper that uh, will appear next month in Nature, uh, we gave 128 men either synthetic oxytocin via an inhaler or uh, placebo blinded. And uh, what we want to do here is to demonstrate causation. I want to show that it actually can induce um, changes in your behavior by giving you this, the hormone. It turns out we can. So uh, in the DM1s and the oxytocin group, 45% showed the maximal trust level versus 21% in the placebo group and uh, the average amount uh, that they trusted others was much higher. Um, and this graph shows some of the data for that. So it looks like I can, in fact, utilize this hormone to um, reduce your social fear of interacting with others and um, motivate you to take this risk. So uh, it doesn't seem that people on oxytocin uh, have better mood. It's uh, not that your belief, you have a belief that DM2s are gonna return more money to you. Um, it seems to reduce the sort of uh, uh, anxiety we have with interacting with someone who we haven't seen before. So it does motivate kind of positive social behaviors. And it's interesting, as I said, the people who kind of followed uh, their uh, body and their brains uh, guide to trust and be trustworthy, in fact, made more money than uh, the people who played the Nash equilibrium. So. Um, I think in many senses, 
if we just listen to our intuition, if we listen to uh, what our body's telling us to do, then we're reaching a socially desirable outcome, which is very interesting. Uh, and the implications of that, uh, uh, as Michael suggested, are profound. So um, it doesn't happen all the time, and there certainly are bastards out there, but on average, most of the time, uh, when you trust someone, they're trustworthy. Uh, and lastly, I should say that when we give subjects uh, uh, oxytocin uh, exogenously, we don't affect the behavior of DM2s. Why is that? If you already have, because most people are, are DM2s are getting a big surge of oxytocin anyway, because almost everybody trusts each other. So those receptors are mostly bound up. So if I exogenously increase your oxytocin levels, it has no behavioral or biologic effect because those receptors are bound. Okay, so the whole story seems to hold together. Okay, and lastly, we looked at distrust. So we thought, uh, if, this is an, if social behaviors of this sort are an important biologic system, um, most important systems have more than one driver. There's two, two sides of control. For example, think of hunger. We're getting late in the day now. Your stomach may be grumbling. It may be signaling to you that it's time to eat, uh, and um, that's controlled by uh, um, a hormone called ghrelin, and there's another hormone called leptin that when you've eaten enough, tells you to stop feeding, okay, that most of us listen to. Uh, so there's two sides of control because it's a very important, feeding is a very important behavior. We think social behaviors are very important. Maybe there's two sides to this. Maybe there's this oxytocin side in which uh, we're motivated to um, be trustworthy uh, physiologically. We thought, what about distrust? What about when we get the signal of distrust as a DM2? Um, in a study of uh, around 200 subjects, what we found is that when men receive a signal of distrust, and distrust here is, I'm a DM2 and I was sent very little. So I don't know who this person is. I matched with someone randomly in the lab, but they just didn't trust me. They sent me zero dollars or one dollar. They blew it, right? They had this chance to, to walk away with a big chunk of money, and they just didn't do it. Uh, men had a, a proportional rise in a hormone called dihydrotestosterone. DHT is sort of, I think I have a slide on this. What happened to that? Uh, DHT is uh, sort of, uh, High octane, the slide, the slide's missing. DHT is high octane testosterone. Testosterone is mostly protein bound, so it's inactive. DHT is a thing that causes, uh, the, the hormone that causes virilization in men during puberty. It causes hair maturation. Any of the guys with male pattern baldness, you are alpha males. You have high levels of DHT because uh, too much DHT causes your hair to fall out and just the right amount causes your hair to uh, mature properly. Uh, it is, uh, uh, available both in men and women, although men have a higher average level. So what we find in men is that the less you're sent as a DM2, the more you have a surge in DHT. You have this kind of aggressive response, so you don't like it. You blew it, pal. Go outside and let's mix it up. <laughs> women, much cooler physiologically. And again, we're measuring a whole suite of hormones here. Women report that they don't like being trusted, distrusted, but they don't have this strong physiologic response. Okay. And lastly, uh, we are doing many more studies now uh, looking at uh, functional MRI and uh, giving folks different kinds of drugs and, and uh, determining uh, causally how these neuroactive hormones affect behaviors. Um, but uh, in short, I think uh, this is an important new finding that suggests that oxytocin is a guide to weaving our way through this complicated social environment that humans live in, and it helps us have this a quick and intuitive sense of who to trust and who not to trust. And uh, I'll leave, uh, end with an uh, English proverb. It's an equal failing to trust everybody and to trust nobody. Thank you very much.